the Joe Rogan experience. Uh, this has been one of the most frustrating things that I've seen and experienced throughout my over six years in Congress that really started um, like when I first went up after I got elected. Uh, where after every election happens, the new members of Congress, they go and uh, they have what's called new member orientation. And they give you these books and here's the maps and here's where your office is and, you know, all the all the administrative and logistical stuff. But very quickly, I would say within the first few days, um, you know, where we first come in together as Democrats and Republicans immediately. OK, Democrats go this way. Republicans go this way, immediately separated. And what we're told right off the bat is look, this is about uh, getting wins for our political party. And if you work with a Republican, then that's going to hurt the party, especially if you work with a Republican that the Democratic Party is trying to take out. Forget the substance of the idea. Forget the substance of the bill. And this happens on the opposite side as well. Republicans with Democrats, both both political parties are, diff are, are um, guilty of this, where they're really putting the interests of the political party ahead of the people who just voted for us to go and serve them. And not just the Democrats who voted for me, but yes, the, the independents and the Republicans, both who voted for me or who didn't, but who uh, I serve as part of my constituency. And uh, you just you, you continue. I've continued to see this where, you know, you'll have a bill that because it's a Democrat bill, Republicans will vote against it. Substance aside or a Republican bill, Democrats will vote against it just because it's a Republican bill. But then, hey, if if they come in and, you know, a month or a year later, introduce the same bill or a similar bill. But now because it's a Democratic bill, OK, everybody, hey, let's go. Let's go and support this legislation. You can even imagine why there is so much gridlock in Washington, why nothing really gets done, and ultimately how this divisiveness and this hyperpartisanship is hurting the ability for the needs of the American people to be served. When you talk about people like yourself that are completely funded by the public mm -hmm. and you have this very logical and objective way of discussing this gridlock, do you think that the future is in young people like yourself getting involved in politics that they they're not connected to this old world for 35 45 yeah. years this world it sounds like this is just what you do yeah i mean i watched house of cards mm -hmm. i get kind of i get it sort of <laughs> what that that seems like chaos yeah. and it seems like there's no way to fix that it's almost like these people have to stop being politicians yeah. they have to be voted out or die off I mean, yeah if well, I think it, it's evident where we see those who are very entrenched in this um, this broken system feel very threatened by the rise of people powered campaigns, individual contributions coming in and supplanting the big money that they get from, um, you know, the PACs and PACs and lobbyists. And and, and there's fear there because they see um, their whole world being disrupted by people like me or others who are coming in and saying, no, we're not buying into any of that. And we're coming in to actually fulfill the mission that we've been charged with by those who voted for us to serve the people, all the people of this country. And would you say that, would you, well, this is my position. I think that Trump plays a part of that because I think he was the first guy to camp, to come, to come in basically self-funded or being funded through his own means. Mm -hmm. And not listening to the rest of the Republican Party saying, hey, I'm going to take over mm -hmm. and I'm going to do this my way. And then knowing that he could do that and knowing that there were so many Republicans against him and knowing that there's so many Democrats against him as well. But yet he's still the president. Yep. Like people are like, Jesus, this is a fragile system. Like this system is it's what they've done to acquire power is still very vulnerable, even though they have this deeply entrenched system yeah. of weird little relationships that. It's not good enough yeah. that if the people do rise up and they decide, hey, we want to put Tulsi in as president, you're going to have a different situation. A lot of you clowns are going to be out of work. Absolutely. I mean, and that's really that that's the message that we're carrying to to living rooms and town halls and communities across the country is uh, Washington continues to underestimate the power of the people. And it's but supposed if, to work for you. Exactly. And that's the thing is, you know, our founding fathers had this vision for our country that our government would be of the people by the people and for the people. And instead, what we have is a government of the rich and powerful by and for the rich and powerful or of the special interests in corporations by and for the special interests in corporations. Yes. 
and, you know, we the people get left behind. And they continue to talk to us like they're in control. Yeah. They're one of us, and they're supposed to be public employees. They're yeah. supposed to be servants That's right. of the public. Yeah. They don't talk like that. No. They talk like people who are in a position of power and influence. Yeah. And it's not healthy. It's yeah. not a healthy perspective. It, it, it's evident of that huge disconnect between yes. the bubble that is Washington and the reality of the lives that we live every day, people all across this country. That's always the case, though, when people get in control of things. They always meddle, make it easier for them, make it better for them. What can I do to make this a little easier? Is there another way? How can I help right. myself here? How can I make sure that when I get out of office, I can do these public speaking yeah. tours and make a quarter million dollars a pop? Yeah. When I hear about the money those guys make to just go and talk, I'm yeah. like, what? who is paying for that? Right. Who is paying to listen to Hillary Clinton What are they talk? getting out of it? What are you getting out of That's that? That's right. Like, can I listen? I yeah. would love to like pre- pretend to be a banker, to put a lizard skin face mask <laughs> on and go sit with yeah. those bankers and listen to one of those conversations that Hillary Clinton got paid a quarter million dollars to talk to. Yeah. Never release the transcripts for What me. is that about? Yeah. So, like, who is it's some weird sneaky deal mm-hmm. that they make yeah where I mean you, nobody it, wants to pay that like go no. to that in Madison Square Garden see how many tickets you sell yeah right exactly <laughs> they're, they're, Bill and Hillary are doing like yeah. the speaking tour thing right now yeah. I am baffled as to who is going to pay to go see Bill and Hillary bullshit them that's right they're doing they're it together now real. right yeah yeah Bill is so old. Why doesn't he just come clean? You know, I, I, I would love to get that guy and just get him drunk and put him on the, just like have him just talk about life. No, you only got like a few years left. Everything's falling apart in your body. Yeah. What are your regrets? Yeah. What'd you do wrong? What could you have done differently? Stop all this bullshitting. Yeah. Like what, what, you know, you should have him on your show. Oh, Joe. I would love to, I would love to do mushrooms with him. That's <laughs> what I wanted go. to. I would have him on the show <laughs> and uh, do it in uh, Colorado because they decriminalize yep. mushrooms. <laughs> It's just yeah. th- this role of being the person that is in control of this country has always been this impossible task. And when I see a person like you who wants to do it, yeah. I, I say, listen, you have some of the best ideas and the most healthy perspective that I've ever heard from anyone that's ever running for president. But why would you want to do that to yourself? Those are the two things that I think of. Because it's not for myself. And, and it's not to be in control of the country and the people, it's to serve the people and our country. It's a continuation of this mission that I've chosen for my life to be of service, to find different ways to do that. You know, it started in Hawaii with gathering my friends as a kid and going and picking up trash off the beach on the weekends and experiencing even then at a young age that that made me happier than, than anything else. Than you know, going and playing video games with my friends or anything like that, and that um, that mission that that was deeply ingrained in me further with my service in the military, serving as a soldier. Where you know I'm serving alongside people of all walks of life, as you know, every race, religion, ethnicity, orientation, everything. Every one of us wearing that same uniform, serving that same flag that represents the American people with that laser-like focus on putting service above self. And that's what I seek to bring to the White House, to, to restore those values of integrity and honor uh, and respect, to make it so that that White House is a beacon of light for the American people, to know that that White House belongs to them and represents them and their interests and their interests alone. Does anybody, I mean, even a person like you who's on the outside, do you think anybody truly knows what it's like to run the country? until they get in there do they could, can you even have an idea of what how impossible a task it is to be in control of the economy the environment the the infrastructure the military our, our position in the world it seems like the most insane duty yeah. to require someone to run all those things to be yeah. aware of all those things to be responsible for all of the successes and all of the failures yeah um, it's an awesome responsibility. There's no question about that. Uh, and I think it fulfills that, um, that, higher, that, higher, that higher calling, that this is not about any kind of selfish interest. This, for me, is not about any kind of ambition that I've had. I've never had any kind of thought, well, I want to be president one day, or even I want to be a member of Congress one day. It's always been about 
uh, how can I how can I best be of service and how can I make a greater impact? And that's what I've seen throughout my time in Congress where I've served on these committees. I've served on the Foreign Affairs and Armed Services Committees. I've been been calling for and fighting for an end to these wasteful regime change wars, an end to this new Cold War and nuclear arms race. There's only so much I can do as a member of Congress uh, to be able to serve as president and commander in chief. I know that I can make that kind of impact and see change in our policy that keeps our country safe, that moves us closer to that future of peace and prosperity. And that's where I hope to be able to make a difference.